Good afternoon. This is Ellen Lord, and I'm very pleased to be moderating a panel today, subject being strengthening the defense innovation base and speeding innovation. I have three great panelists with me. I've got Rob Jekyll, CEO of Airbus U.S. Space and Defense, Young Bang, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology, and Jason Jason Rothji from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Office of Strategic Capital. So I think everyone knows that around town here for about six months, there's been an enormous amount of activity on the defense innovation base. How do we strengthen it? How do we make it more resilient? How do we bring non-traditional players in all for the purpose of fielding innovative technology equipping our war fighters with more capability downrange more quickly. So what we're going to do is talk to each of these panelists in rapid fire succession. And I'm going to start with Rob Jekyll. So Rob, as you're representing industry here, I want to ask you about your perspective on enablers and inhibitors for using COT solutions. Yeah, and first of all, thank you for, for having me on the panel and with an esteemed co-panelist who have also quite a bit of industry industry knowledge. I think when you talk about commercial off-the-shelf technology or, or commercial uh, technology that's leveraged for the defense industrial base, it, it helps you move faster, right? So the non-recurring expenses, uh, the NRCs have been burned down in the commercial NRC, market. So no non-recurring non, non costs <laughs> have been burned down uh, and, 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 uh, the development costs are already there and you're allowed, you're able to very quickly take a commercial technology and adapt it and integrate it for a defense mission. And where I've seen some of those enablers in play, just to give two specific examples, one is a more recent one in the space domain and, and another is a, is a more historic exp uh, experience in the helicopter domain with the U.S. Army, Army National Guard. So in space, what Space Development Agency is doing right now, which is part of the Space Force, with this proliferated warfighter space architecture is to move from a 10-year development scheme uh, for a satellite that will cost billions of dollars and be in geosynchronous orbit to move to a proliferated low Earth orbit constellation where you're putting in hundreds of satellites and doing them every two years. And what this has enabled and actually required is leveraging commercial companies like Airbus. In this area, we're a bit of a, a new entrant and non-traditional player but we have nearly 600 uh, satellites in orbit for commercial constellations. That has given us a industrial base and scalable uh, infrastructure that we can now expand to go service the national security market. So we have a footprint in Florida, we're expanding it, and this allows us to keep pace with contract on orbit within two years. And the other thing that uh, Space Development Agency is doing as an enabler is the use of OTAs, other transaction authorities, so more of a commercial contracting scheme. Not going through the two to three year joint staff it, requirements yep. process, POM development. Right, right, and imposing a lot of the DFAR, FAR federal acquisition regulations mm -hmm. onto the, the customer base. And also the fact that they're doing spiral development. Every two years is going to be another tranche. So you have commercial companies that see if they don't win one tranche, whether it's on the satellite bus or the payload or space situation awareness or laser comms, they can continue to invest knowing, okay, there's some commercial applications, but there's also going to be another opportunity to get into the next tranche. And these are satellites that will be replenished every five, six years. So it's using the commercial space industry and creating an adjacent market in the national security space. So companies who are, have the commercial technology, but are set up to do classified work and satisfy yeah. those requirements you're able to move at scale and speed. So, so, so. makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. Typical dual use here, we've moved in the past 60 years from the government developing most of the innovative technology to industry doing that. So mm -hmm. we need to leverage it. Great, thanks, Bob. All right, we are gonna move to Young representing the Army here. Um, the Army obviously has been very involved in supporting Ukraine and the conflict there. What have you learned um, about rapid fielding and how has that affected this experience in Ukraine? Um, how has that affected the way that the Army is looking at fielding new technology? Yeah, I, well, first, thank you for having me on the panel. And um, I think that's a great question. And I think building on a little bit of what we just talked about, 
there's a lot of lessons learned that we've learned uh, from Ukraine. And some of the things about rapid fielding is, uh, folks already know, you talked about OTAs. We've been using OTAs in the armies pretty prolifically across the services. And we're using that to accelerate the 10 year life cycle development for us in the army. And that's why we've been able to get to some of these 24 and 23 capabilities a lot faster. And when you think about Ukraine specifically, the late we probably saw in the news, our, our Abrams got in there. When we're talking about it, we're talking years for that to go in there. And our ability to rapidly work um, with industry to really accelerate that, there's a lot of complexities, not just about taking the exquisite non-exportable components out, but also kind of the multiple variations of the tanks that we have. But we've been able to actually use some of the authorities that Congress has already given us. We've been able to be a little bit more creative with OTAs and MTAs to get to certain pathways faster. And that is another case of where we've actually been able to get this now M1 tank in theater, right, last week, which is well short of even a year. So it's been only about eight, almost nine months that we've gotten that through there. And that's an example of how we've used that now break. We've been actually using this opportunity to really think about how do we scale this industrial base? And we know how, you know, the complexities of the industry, and you just talked about the innovations and how now industry is really uh, shifting that. We have some exquisite weapon systems that have actually um, increased in demand across the board. And some of those technologies, as exquisite as they are, are from the 80s and 90s and the production and the tooling and the dyeing. Uh, and so we've looked at how do we actually accelerate some of the COTS products to replace obsolete parts or use COTS products in addition to or to augment, or you've seen a lot of things, right? Ukraine's been a hot test bed for uh, UAVs. And those are all dual purpose now, right? They were almost entirely commercial, uh, but we've been actually able to uh, buy a lot of those and the Ukrainians have actually used them uh, to a really great extent. So we've been doing those using both kind of our commercial as well as our organic industrial base. We've been using different OTA, or I'm sorry, different uh, acquisition authorities that we've already been provided, but actually getting creative with them. And some of them we've done multiple um, pathways on a, a platform. I love it. Creative compliance. Here. Absolutely. So yeah. there's things that we're actually developing now that we've used an OTA to get uh, through an MTA, and we're doing a software pathway so we could get to a rapid either fielding or a um, MCA decision. So uh, we've been doing a lot across the board. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing I, I don't know if you um, really want to um, think about is like, how do we incentivize? And again, we need industry's help. And again, I think capital and investments are part of that. But right. again, this the scale in which we had production in the industrial base is not the same. So we have to leverage commercial. We have to use organic. We have to encourage investments across the board. So, Young, I think there's so many great stories that the Army has there. I'm hoping these will be captured and memorialized at the Defense Acquisition University so other people um, can learn about it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, so uh, Honorable LaPlante talks about it all the time. The Army has clearly cracked the code on how to accelerate acquisitions for this fight. And he kind of jokes that, hey, the other services need, need to take some lessons from our playbook. So we're happy to share what we've learned. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Okay, so let's talk about capital, private capital that is needed to back emerging technologies before there are actually contracts out there given by DOD. So Jason is working on new tools to incentivize building some of this technology infrastructure, if you will. You want to tell us a little bit about the Office of Strategic Capital and how you envision that working? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks again for having us here on this panel. You know, we're, I think we're still the youngest organization inside of the DOD and, but the secretary established Office of Strategic Capital last December to attract and scale private capital into our national security priorities. And our first focus are our critical and emerging technology areas. Um, much of the work that the, has evolved into what is OSC now has come from a history of folks that have worked in a number of innovation organizations, that have had careers in acquisitions to, that have really focused on, on answering this non-traditional question, right? How do we bring new in and how do we accelerate capabilities directly for the warfighter? You know, this allows us to have an expanded supplier base that attacks some of these 
acquisition issues we've always contended with, right? We want to decrease, decrease cost to the taxpayer. We want to accelerate performance. We want to decrease schedule risk and supplier risk. So how do you do that? Well, you got to grow. You have to grow an industrial base that's going to support the department. And I think what we've realized is in this new era of, uh, of competition that we find ourselves today, it's not only the capability providers directly that we want to bring in, but it's also our critical components. A lot of the work that, that we did at, at AFWorks, which was in the Air Force, and DIU has focused on are these core capabilities, right? Accelerating tanks and drones and geospatial analytics and comms networks. But what they haven't focused on are things like semiconductors or biotech or advanced materials, right? Nobody says, hey, I'm going to put a semiconductor into the hands of the soldiers, sailors, sailors airmen, and marines, but all of our warfighters aren't going to be able to do much unless they've got semiconductors in their systems. And I think we've seen things through the Chips and Science Act, for example, that that currently we are focused on an era of uh, of competition where we need to ensure that the critical component technologies that comprise not only our national but our economic security are 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 taken care of or supportive in ways that ensure that the Department of Defense can easily, reliably, and securely access these technologies. And, and as OSC looks across how to do this, how do we ensure these technologies that are often invented here? or can we can be accessed by our military uh, uh, systems, our capabilities, and our warfighters, uh, we look at the tools that we've seen in our history that have been used effectively here. We don't build procurement programs for things like semiconductors. Um, and so it's hard to use some of these existing tools to solve this specific problem. So you're talking about the fundamental technology required to apply the technology to warfighting solutions. Absolutely. Car we, we invest hundreds of millions of dollars in things like carbon nanotubes, and, and MEMS devices. However, we don't actually build programs to manufacture those things. We build programs to manufacture the capabilities that integrate the systems, that integrate the components that are often funded from our s and It's that budget. valley of death between it, the s and and the actual application. It's, it's not only the valley of death in this linear way we thought, but we've added an extra axis where we're looking at the supply chain mm -hmm. as well. And that's where we're really targeting. A lot of our programs are focused on this fundamental core enabling technologies. Now, because of that, we get to use different financial tools. These are, we want to consider these defense and non-defense. These are purely commercial markets that have a necessary connective tissue to the defense industrial base, but like critical minerals, right? We use those everywhere, but we would never think of that as a defense technology, yeah. but it's, we require it. We need to have, you know, we need to have our magnets and our F-35 so we can fly them. I, I think the, the, the important part of OSC now is focused on is what tools can we use to do this job? And that's where we've seen the opportunities to use things like loans and loan guarantees. Why loans and loan guarantees? One, they're efficient and scalable. Two, they're a little to no cost to the taxpayer. And because these industries are inherently commercially based, they don't require future federal appropriations or procurement dollars to make sure that these technologies can generate enough revenue to repay the government. Yeah. Perfect. We're going to stop right there Great. and come back to some specifics in a minute. But I want to focus on partners and allies. As a nation, we are differentiated from some of our strategic competitors that we work closely with partners and allies. Part of getting the defense industrial base strengthened and broadened is bringing in those allies and partners. Rob, can you comment on foreign military sales and what's working and what's not working right now and how that can be leveraged? Yeah, well, what's working, I mean, FMS is a great tool for a couple of reasons. One, if you, if you have a production capacity in the United States, often at the end of a program of record, the FMS market will be something that allow you to maintain that capacity and capability. Um, it also helps interoperability with the allies who acquire those technologies and capabilities. And that that, al that asymmetric advantage of, of integrated allied defense is really one of our, our key uh, asymmetric advantages. So in principle, it's a, gr it's a great enabler for, for the defense industrial base and strengthening it writ large. So NTIB, uh, the National 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 technology investment uh, investment base uh, industrial base and yeah. and your NATO allied base. Um, I would say that industry would probably say and and Honorable Bill Laplante would would recognize this and has just this week. Um, the pacing of it is a, is a little difficult to manage in terms of looking at addressable markets, looking at investments. How long do you maintain a capacity uh, so that you can continue to sell into these markets? 
getting things like letters of requests and tech releaseability approval. Uh, the Army has done a great job on the on these uh, recently, particularly in the in the context of Ukraine. So just but to I interject think here to make sure everyone understands, industry would typically like to do a direct um, commercial sale. Mm -hmm. However, often there are classified portions of programs, protected technology. Sometimes um, the country that needs our capability in the U.S., um, doesn't have the infrastructure to make sure they protect all the information. Mm -hmm. So there's almost an insurance wrapper that goes with foreign military sales. But with that comes a few caveats. And these are the things you're talking about. Yes, yeah, the timing and pacing. And some of these allies, they may not have the program office infrastructure or capability to run a procurement. And so direct commercial sales can kind of go sideways, even, even, even more so than FMS. So it's a great tool I would just say that if we could accelerate it and streamline it, uh, it would be an even greater force multiplier in terms of industrial uh, base resilience. Very good. Can I just add to that? I think that's a great point. I think uh, we've seen that. We've heard that from our allied partners a lot. And so we are looking at also how do we potentially accelerate foreign military sales as well as other security cooperation and security agreements. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is is there a way to get te technical data packages from our suppliers and vendors earlier in the life cycle? To that point, like you're saying, if we can get that earlier with the vendor, we can work on exportal versions almost in parallel. So then that way, when we get to full rate and uh, or low rate and a full rate of production, we could potentially have be entertaining the foreign military sales discussion and then getting economy of scales, larger orders, right? Redu reduction in price and cost. So we we have been thinking about that same thing because we've been hearing a lot of the demand signals across the board. And these are one of the things that we're actually looking at. Yeah, so that's a great point. Foreign military sales act as a modulator for the lumpiness of the DOD acquisition cycle. And it's good for our industry. It's good for interoperability with partners and allies and so forth. Okay, so very quickly, if you could just comment, Young, on what about the other way around? Munitions, for instance. We know um, that we have inventories that need to be replenished. We have AUKUS now, um, this trilateral agreement between Australia, UK, the US. We have the National Technological Innovation Base, with help, which helps with exports. What is the Army thinking about potentially partnering with other nations to produce munitions? Yeah, that's a great question. If you've seen uh, anything uh, from Ukraine, you've seen that the consumption rate and the volume of munitions that they're going through is just unprecedented. And so even the current productions that we have, we're actually investing to really scale that. So uh, since this has begun, we're almost at a pace of doubling, for for example, the 155 production rate. So we started at about 14,000. We're at uh, we're about at 50,000. We're going to uh, increase that. So we're about at 100,000 when the when the our investments are over. Uh, but that same point is how do we scale that whole ammunition or industrial base for, around ammunition? And so part of it's like we've been able to actually take so a lot of the things that we've um, had on supply, stockage. We have certain um, training rounds as well as uh, rounds that we have for uh, conflict, but we've been supplying those, but we've also taken more of an allied approach. So we've had a lot of countries, whether it's NATO countries or across the world, prov provide some until we can actually ramp up. And so that's another example where we're having a partner it's the interchangeability you're calling it now, right? Yeah, exactly. So Ukraine was really, we've been always focused about interoperability, but Ukraine's taught us that interchangeability is a critical component. So whether we can fire their weapons or their ammo or vice versa, we need to actually rely on that whole notion to get interchangeability. And that's why the other nations are critical. Uh, we are looking at other agreements, whether it's co-production, uh, with other countries specifically, whether it's, you know, ammunition like 155s or, you know, long range hypersonics, we are looking at other countries as secondary yeah. sources for key components, because there, let's face it, we're still uh, trying to mature that technology. And as we're actually going through that supply chain, if we have critical paths and only one sources, 
it doesn't help us or our partners. Exactly. And I know that Australia is just so geopolitically important to the U.S., given all the activity and potential activity in Indo-PACOM, that there are a lot of efforts going there. All right. So, Jason, you are going to bring us home here and we're going to put up a QR code so that people can get that to get more information about the Office of Strategic Capital. But why don't you tell us what you're going to be doing for the balance of this year? What are the next steps for your office? Now, you know, a lot of the, the conversation today is, uh, from my perspective, really focused on this importance of us working as an all of nation approach to accomplish some of these national security objectives. One of the first programs that OSC has launched is a partnership with the SBA to provide uh, um, guarantee small business, small business, sorry, small business administration sure. on their small business investment company program. There you go. A sister program to the small business innovative research program, the SBIR program, which many of our defense colleagues are, are well aware of. Um, the SBIC program born out of uh, uh, 1957 era Eisenhower uh, uh, policies to help us gain technological overmatch over the Soviet Union. Uh, it provides loan guaranteed loans to private investors to partner with private equity to create public private partnership investment funds that are investing in areas that are vital to national security. Fantastic. You know what? I think we are out of time, but you are giving us a great example about how the interagency works. So government, one agency working with another. So kudos on working with SBA on that. I think we're going to flash up the QR code and thank you all very much. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.